since I've had a son, I've quite got into having a little bit of Mario. Anybody else like a bit of Mario? Now the question is, while I'm playing this and trying to get through the Mushroom Kingdom, which is not easy in this life, am I learning? And it kind of got me thinking that when you go to school and you're little, you kind of go bouncing up the path and school is quite fun. At least that's how my son and his peers kind of sell it. They bounce in, they do yoga, they laugh when they fall over. Everything's a new experience and it's lit and it's a practical thing. And they come home covered in paint. Paint where you can't even imagine how they've got paint there. And they're deeply happy with their experience. And as somebody who's been teaching for about four years, I don't see that passion and hunger in the learners that I see in front of me a lot often when they come in. They seem quite distracted or apathetic in terms of how they engage. And that seems to be, to a point, irrespective of how it's delivered or whether it's something you've tried that's new. So it got me thinking, maybe if they're not going to change, maybe we have to respond and change how we deliver what we do. And, and somebody put it like this, um, if you were investing in a tech company and they said, we're gonna make one computer and we're not gonna change that computer for the next 20 years, would you invest in that company? The likelihood is you wouldn't. But if you look at education and if you look at delivery, we still have tables, we still have desks, we still have this. This is this is only slightly different to a blackboard. And so things are pretty much the same. And so should we be surprised that we get the response we get from some of our learners? when we are repeating the same thing that we're doing. So it got me thinking, is there a way that we could potentially change the way the learners think? So I came up with the idea that maybe we could blend Socratic inquiry with augmented reality and artificial intelligence um, for a more immersive learning experience. And I think that that's really important. So, I think we need to think about how we learn and I think we need to think about how we retain knowledge. Now, I presume most of you in this room drive. Do you think about how you change gear? No, it's something that becomes a second nature and it becomes hardwired into what you do. And it, and it comes from a physical activity that is repeated over and over again with a measurable, consistent response, be it in terms of the sound of the engine, the speed of the movement, or, the, or how the brakes work, all those things. So I think that that's a really, really important thing to tap into, the idea that we can, we can hardwire. And if you think about certain other learning things that we do, we don't break them down into tick boxes in the way that we do with a lot of education. If you look at swimming, swimming is a really good example of something where you can either swim or you can't or you're in the process of learning. But the whole thing with swimming, it's very difficult to break it down into discrete little bits. It's an, it's an entirety, it's an activity. And once you're in the water and once you've learnt, you don't lose that. They, you know, they sell that baggage on the bike, don't they? That you, you know, once you get back on the bike, you can always remember. And I, and I kind of think, well, maybe that's what we should be thinking about. Maybe we should be thinking about a more kind of aesthetic approach to learning, or one that's more um, in tune with the learner. And I got thinking about the complexity of what we're looking at, and I thought to myself, well. When we think, we think in really complicated ways. 
But actually, when we look at the practical bits of what we do, the actual doing, we tend to take all that and we tend to boil it down to its basic constituent parts and only use the bits that we need. All those other bits are there, but do we necessarily need them? And I think that removing extraneous stimulation, focusing the learner in a very controlled way that they're able to then immerse in, takes all that cloud and fog and breaks it down to its very basic constituent parts so that then the learner can get out of it what they want to. You know, you don't necessarily need to know all the workings of your car's engine to drive, do you? Some people are interested in that and some people are not, but at the end of the day, you're still achieving the same end whether you do or don't, but you don't necessarily need it. And I think sometimes we add layers on that we don't need. And I think immersing the learner, the learner will get out of it the experience they want. So one of the things that I was interested in was the idea of Socratic learning. The idea that we empower the learners to almost in a way take control and ownership of the learning. So it kind of struck me that we have learning outcomes and we have criteria that we need to meet. But do we need to get bogged down in the whole lesson planning to such an extent that we stifle creativity and that we, that we somehow spoon feed our learners in a way that is unhelpful? Because if they're only ever going to be able to come up with things because they've been told without questioning, then I think we deny them the richness of an education in terms of how an education should be. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Socratic method in terms of a breakdown, you have an inquisitor that asks questions, you have an interlocutor who answers the questions and uh, revises a hypothesis, and then you have an elenchus who considers the hypothesis, thinks critically, identifies weaknesses, poses the next question and revises the hypothesis. In my experience using this method, you are pretty much guaranteed to have all three of those in the room. And if you haven't got all three, you can at least be one of them mm. and you can facilitate the, the experience. So what we did in one of my lessons was we, we talked about addiction. So I wanted to talk about risk-taking behaviour. So we talked about heroin addiction, we talked about prostitution. So the first question that I said is, should you have unprotected sex? Um, and the answer from my class was no, because you could get sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV, and you could have an unwanted pregnancy. I said, yeah, but what about if you're addicted to drugs and the only way you can pay for those drugs is through sex work. And they said, yeah, but you wouldn't have to sleep with many people, would you, to, to pay for your drugs? And I said, well, I'll be honest, I don't know, not having done it, but shall we find out? So they went onto their phones and one of them went and looked at Devon and Cornwall's website for police and it came up with the cost of a bag of heroin. Then we then looked at sexual health partners in the Bay that look after sex workers. We asked how much sex was. It was five or ten pound, depending on what was on offer. And so you, if you, we worked it out, and it was roughly nine or ten people a day. And when you think about the risks that those people are taking, so. Did any of us know that before we started the journey? And the answer was, N I didn't, and neither did they. But did we data mine and did we use the electronic resources to find an answer? Yes. 
did we check the validity of the source? Yes, we did. So when it came up and it was a website and it was an, an unsubstantiated website, we said no. But when we saw Devon and Cornwall Police, that's a valid source, so we'll use that. So we, we, we were starting to learn to be discerning in terms of what we had. Um, and it kind of put the ball into the learner's court and I was just kind of there to guide a little bit if we went off track. But in all fairness, we didn't really go off track because they were quite fascinated about the fact that they would be interested to explore and to learn. And that was through the use of their phones. So they're not texting or Snapchatting, they're actually on their phones learning. And if one person hadn't got their phone or their battery was low, they would double up on the team and they would share the resource between them, which was nice because they were working collaboratively. So one of the issues is that with the Socratic method is that there is the, the bastardization of it, which is where it's been corrupted. And uh, the technical term that was coined by Frank Harting was the idea of pimping. So pimping was a term that was first reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it was used to refer to a series of difficult and often intentionally unanswerable questions posed to medical students and house staff in quick succession. The object of pimping is to teach, motivate and involve the learner in clinical rounds while maintaining a dominant hierarchy and cultivating humility by riding the learner's egotism. Pimping has been criticised as being demeaning and humiliating to the learner. So you can understand when I talk about Socratic learning that some people are a little bit wary because of the experiences of this. So going back in the past, I was teaching medical students in a Russell Group University and my person who I was under said to me after one lesson, he said, I don't really think you're really cut out for this. You're far too nice to the learners. You need to be a lot harsher. Which when you think about how we nurture and support our learners now is completely the other way around and I think is the right way to be. Rather than to put people down and to devalue what they do know. So I think that's really important. So when we look at the way that we teach, teaching under the MRC definition is a complex intervention because there's lots of interplay. There's the interplay with the physical stuff. There's the interplay with the technology. There's the interplay with the learners. There's how the learners relate to each other. There's how the learners relate to me. There's how I relate to you in terms of as a colleague. What ideas do we share? There's lots of different things going on. So I think the difficulty that you have with this type of thing and by its very nature, a complex intervention is something which works, but you can't break it down into one particular part. You have to look at it as a whole and you have to look at it in a context. So if you can look at it in the context and accept that it works, you may not understand all the mechanics initially, but I think you, you ride on the back of the fact that you what you see is what you see. And um, otherwise, I think what you do is you bog down in too much detail into the little bits and actually you miss the fact that you've got this great opportunity to try something that works. So that's really, really important. And one of the questions that somebody's posed, and it was Penelope Hall, Hall she suggested that how much variation can you have between doing it? So if I demonstrate how this works now and then you go and use this in your classroom setting or you use it and you use it, is the way that you each of you use it going to be the same? And the answer is it might be or it might not be. There will be a degree of flex. But as long as the spirit and the intention is there, according to the, the research, that is an acceptable way of contextualising it. So if Jackie were doing it, she would do it in the health context, whereas you do it in the sport context. And therefore they might be very different. But if you break it down into its very basic forms, you're both doing the same. 
So the idea that you can't you can't copy this because it has to be exactly the same isn't isn't a good enough reason not to try it because actually it has to be fluid for it to work because our learners are fluid and because our, the learning is not a passive process it's it's very dynamic in terms of how it squirts out into unknown ways and oft, often when we when we have our best experiences with learners it comes from somewhere we never expected to end up with in that lesson but it's a you know it's a it's a lesson learned in a good way so would you all agree that phones could be a good thing or a bad thing yeah so there has to be a trust there has to be trust there so if you're going to put the confidence in your learners to not abuse it then give it a go and then if they don't meet your expectations in terms of the right use then that gets taken away and that option isn't available but if you sell it in a way that it's a positive I think that's really important so what sort of tech are we talking about so I'll show you the cameras in a little bit but one of the things that we do is that we quite often use Siri or Alexa in the lesson to ask a question and it will often ping up an answer onto the screen. So if I was going to ask how to enter the top atrium, the right atrium of the heart, I'd ask the learner how they would go about it. They would find an image. They would then talk me through what to do. So I'm kind of being used remotely and they're telling me where to cut, what angle and how deep. So in our in our everyday lives we're using technology more and more would you agree and if we look at what we do now in, at home and if you look at what we do in work there is a bit of a gap i found out yesterday that you can cash a check using an app on your bank by photographing the check which blew my mind because i thought that's a brilliant idea it saves me going to the bank and what applications could that also be used for? And when we put things onto screens and we want information, if the learner wants to li really listen to what you want to say, rather than them being there and struggling to get it all written down, what a lot of my learners do is they will take a photograph of the screen, flick it into their phone, they'll put a number on it, and then they'll go back to them. And what I find is at the mid-break of the lesson, I'll be flicking through, looking at them, just reading them, making sure they're all right. And they use it for their revision. So that's used in a positive way. And what I find is that I don't get them on their phones for non-learning reasons. They're purely on them for the learning. And that goes right across the board for levels. I've even, I've even got level one learners using their phones, which I was really positively encouraged about because I wasn't sure how that was going to go with that particular learning group. Um, if we think about the way that we learn with the augmented reality, we're talking about a multimodal kinesthetic learning, one that uses lots of senses, lots of imagery, things that will make you get lost in the experience and if you look at the if you look at the triangle 75 percent is learning is learning through doing which makes sense and those of us, those of us that, that nurse know that the title of Gibbs's reflective model which was published in 1988 in the Oxford University Press was learning by doing mm -hmm. And it was about reflection and it was about the lived experience. It was about what I suppose you would broadly term phenomenology. The lived experience, the individual lived experience. And then if we look further down, we've got participating. And then further down, we've got receiving. And actually, I think we need to be pushing more for the blue rather than the other. Okay. 
So, if you remember at the start, I talked to you about the fact that I didn't see learners with the drive and enthusiasm to get through the draw excited. There was one time when this did happen. Okay, I was in my room waiting for them to come in. Normally, I had to go and get them out of the room where they were, out of the canteen area where they were to come. And on this occasion, they came running into my room. And they were doing this. Is it over here? No, is it over there? And I'm stood there going, what on earth are they doing? And then one of my class said, you've got a Bulbasaur in your room. <laughs> and I went, you what? <laughs> and I'm sure when you see this in a minute, this will probably be something you're very familiar with, but it kind of shows how it caught fire when it came. So I think what we saw there when, when it happened was we saw something that really took like for the younger generation and it, and it still carries on today. There are still people that do this, there are still people that follow this. It's got more and more complex. And had we as old people um, thought about it, we would have never imagined something like this ever existed. You know, I took my little boy out and we were by the post office and there was a Pikachu. It was the most, and you know, it was the first time we'd walked down a road. Because walking is silly, Daddy, and we don't walk. But we do when we want a Pokemon. So we changed our behaviour because we were taken over by the whole experience. And I think that was really important. Um, and then this came out very recently.
Now, I know that's a conceptualization, but watching them open up the body and rotate the heart is a fantastically good way for people to learn about the anatomy. It's a really, really nice thing. It gives them the boldness to do it without being worried about the blood and the smell. Because let's be honest, these bits are not very nice for some learners, but they want to still learn the experience so that they can use it for their patients. I think that's a beautiful example of how that could be used. It also has a recording feature, and I think you and I spoke about this, that you can use this for communication because you can look at it from the opposite person's perspective, from the perspective of the person that's here, because it films through. And we can do that with Google Glass, and we can do that with the whole lens. And that's a really powerful tool. So, mobile phones, turn it on its head. For our learners, we know that the technology is a really big thing for them. They send approximately four and a half thousand texts a month. They find it difficult to discern between strong and weak sources, so we need to teach them that it's not just about what you find, but it's about the credibility of what you find. But they're familiar with the technology. My little boy decided that he wanted to buy a toy. So he he um, he was in the lounge very quietly, and that's generally not a very good sign. He, I thought he's up to something. And then I got a phone call from the bank, and the bank said, "Just want to check something with you." And suggest they said, "Have you changed one of your standing orders?" And I said, um, "No." And I said, "Who is it to?" And he said, "Oh, it's to your son's bank account. It's." gone up by five times what it was. So I went in the lounge and I said, have you got anything to tell Daddy? Well, I wanted this toy. So uh, what did you do then? Oh, well, I opened your phone. I went into your banking app. I undid your pin. And I saw my name. I recognised my name because I've learned it at school. And I just made the number bigger. And he said, he was six at the time. A six-year-old can do that. Can you imagine what they can do as they get older? I mean, it, the potential is massive. So I think that rather than using the technology as something for them and not for us, it's something we need to encourage. And have you got this on your phones? You got an iPhone? Ah, that's one. The iPhones have got this thing that tells you how long you've been on your phone, what you've been watching, breaks it down. So, what do we reckon? Jackie, how long do you reckon the average teen spends on their phone? I was there, on school. Six hours a day. So, can you imagine, right, how skilled you would be doing any particular task if you dedicated six hours a day? constantly to doing it, irrespective of what it was. You become highly skilled and you become very productive. So, where did this all begin? So this all began, began over at Devon Studio School, which was on the Torquay site by Lidl. And it began with my group. And my group basically were very honest with me. And they said, Andy, we really like you. We think you're a really nice person but you're killing us with PowerPoints and your lessons are really boring. Can you do something about it? Pretty much was what they said. So I said, okay, what would you like? This is more interaction. So this is what we ended up with. And I apologize for the shooting angle. We were quite limited with space when Paul was, when Darren was filming. was in HE before I came to the college and uh, I used to use slides a lot so I had huge powerpoints and what I was noticing was that the learners were not engaging as well. So I negotiated with the learners the style that they would like to do and so what we have is that we have a Socratic questioning way of doing things where the 
work is generated by the, the learners, we collate it on the board and then we give a model example of how to then make that come to life for the assignment. Okay, so what I want you to do with your Chrome books or with your phones is I want you to look at the geographical spread of malaria worldwide, okay? So you'll look at some maps, hop around and see what you found, and then when you've all done looking at your research, we'll pop on board what we found and why we think it's happened. Hello, it's malaria So do you prefer this type of teaching to the PowerPoints we were having before? Yeah, because of the PowerPoints, you just sit there and listen, you're really getting involved, whereas with this, you hold it in more as well, you don't get sort of bored. Is that what you do Yeah, you can learn it. And you're not involved, you can sort of like research as you go along and write the notes instead of just sitting there and... Do you like to catch it on your phones? Yeah, I think when you discuss it as well, because we won't just sit here and listen. I think because we listen, then we talk about it, I think we'll get better. Yeah, I think that's why. The sense I get is that you're a more engaged with the process. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So that was really interesting. So uh, we got really good feedback and they, um, for that particular group that we had, 90% uh, of the group got triple distinction stars overall for their BTECs. And their work was phenomenal. And the standard that jumped when we changed how we delivered it was, was huge. All you need is one idea or one moment to change. So I kind of got came through came up with this idea that actually if we're gonna if we're gonna do the technology, maybe we should take it one step further and maybe we should think about how we deliver it in terms of making it fun. So I thought about um, gamification. So Gamification is a way of learning which is developed from video games. The goal is to maximise enjoyment and engagement through capturing the interests of learners and inspiring them to continue to learn. Okay, So which one would you prefer? I would say probably the one on the left, as long as there was a learning activity to it. Um, so, as some of you know, I was a nurse by profession. And one of the things I had to learn to do, I had to learn to do fairly quickly because I worked in A&M, was I needed to learn how to stitch. So what we have here is we have, you see the little gouge marks? So they represent wounds. So the idea is that you have your thread in your needle and that you close the wound. So I'll show you how it's done. And then I'll tell you why. I'll tell you about one of the problems. Jack, would you do me a favour? Just let me chart this thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So there we go. Thank you. So what we have is we have a needle. And we have a stitch holder. And what you do in essence, is you take the take it and you go through one end of the skin and then through the other, it punctures through, go through. This happens with real stitching with patients as well, particularly if they work outdoors and they've got quite leathery skin. It doesn't go through the hole. So it's a So you take your thread 
Can you take your little finger hold there? And you find the bit you're going to go through, and you go in, and you go through, and it comes over the other end. You pull that through, and then what you then end up with is you end up with a length of thread. And then what you do is you wrap it round a couple of times. You then take the remaining strand and you pull through. And you wrap it around again. And you pull through. And then you cut. Each bit. So can you just say how that's pulled back together okay so if I then ask you to do it based on watching me do it in my experience most of you would really struggle because it's fiddly and there's lots of looping and you saw the speed with which I did it and that's kind of how you do it. So, how about this as an idea? What about if I make a game and we put it through a VR headset or we have it on a on a tablet? Mm. And what we do is we go, there's the worm, watch where the worm's going. And down and round and round. It's coming back, it's pulling through, it's going down and around and it's going through. You can do that again. Right, have a little practice for 10 minutes. And then it's going in. Do you remember like what we said with the driving? And then I give you the needle, and then I give you the stitch holder, and you pull the trigger. And in my experience, people that have learnt through visual imagery and repetition have developed better fine and motor skills to do this. I really struggled with this when I was nursing. I ended up buying a chicken and getting a stitching kit from the hospital and just practicing over a whole weekend because it was just, I found it really hard and now I find it really easy. Um, and it only came through that, but I don't think that's the best experience. I think it's better if you can make it a positive one. And so I think the idea that you would create it and talking to our colleagues over in the university center, they have um, programmers who can program what we want based around what those needs might be so if we know what the skill is we're after they can design things that we can then use to do them so this could be things like venipuncture it could be blood pressures it could be anything does that sound useful so it's all about how we try and rewire the brain so that we retain so it's those experiences that we retain and often we remember things and we learn things without understanding how or why. And I think it's about us trying to reprogram by tricking the brain into thinking it's just having a bit of fun and a bit of downtime. And actually it's learning often quite complex and abstract ideas. And I think that's really important. So that was the image. So if you had that image, and those those were the images in the textbooks, I'm sure, Jackie, you've seen those before. That's how it used to be taught, wasn't it? It was very sterile and it was a book. You still buy a book called The Surgeon's Knot. It's on, on Kindle. I've had a look and I'll be honest, I'm confused by about half the pictures I've seen. Um, and I think that this is probably a bit of better way of doing it to start with, to get an idea. And then we build this in so that that becomes the board and then the other bits become the 
stitch holder and the, and the thread and we do it that way. So there are certain other things to think about and I think context is very important and if you've been in healthcare as long as Jackie and I have you know that things have radically changed from when we when we started and one of the things that we have at Torbay is we have the Da Vinci robot so we have robotic surgery that's done and just to give you an idea of how good these are I'm going to show you what we can do with them That coin is tiny, but it's next to. So, so should we be preparing our learners that are going into healthcare to be tech savvy and prepared to make the transition? Because if this is the equipment that we're using and this is the way things are going, surely we should build this into what we teach and how we teach it because we need to surely we have a responsibility to prepare our learners adequately for the changing healthcare landscape in terms of how care is delivered in the future so this was an article in the guardian guardian all the times millions of patients to see doctors by skype under nhs plan so if that's where we're going to be going then we need to be really on this and we need to think about what we can do and could you have a situation whereby you have cameras like we have here learners coming and talking about their experiences so say if you've got a learner that's very passionate about their life experience maybe they've dealt with depression maybe they've dealt with some other issues and they're happy and open to share Who's to say that that can't then be created into something that's a digital form that can then be used to benefit others and then the technology is seen as an empowering thing rather than something that's not um, not for everyone that was me in the office today I'll be honest I could not tell what was going on around me I was completely immersed in the Jurassic Park roller coaster thing that I was on that made me feel very queasy. So thank you, Alex. It was a very interesting experience. Um, it amazed me how my brain was telling me that I wasn't moving, but my senses were telling me a very different story. And I think that's really important. One of the things that I think is really challenging sometimes is do you have learners in your lessons that distract other learners? Does that sometimes happen? I think this gets around it because I think that when you're immersed in a situation like you are when you go to a cinema often you get caught up in what you're watching and it ceases to be something that you're conscious of you're almost in that experience and actually you park your day often and it's only later on afterwards that you then come back into reality and then you think oh I need to put the tea on when I get home or I need to do this but for that couple of hours that you're immersed in that experience that is all that's in your in your sphere of thought and I think that that for our learners is probably a good idea and I think if we can manage the timings so that it's not too much but it's enough and I think we'll only learn that by experience and by giving them a try to see 
you can source VR helmets not as nice as this one, but you can source VR helmets pretty much from about £30 or even cheaper. So this could be something you could include within course fees or you could have some sort of fund for those that can't afford so that people have got ownership of their own and then they can then use that as part of their learning journey. And then actually as an organisation, if we're then saying we're in the bay and we've got VR headsets and we are using them in our lessons and we are actively doing something that is radically different to everywhere else, then our reputation is enhanced and then people are interested in investing further into new things because they all say they're willing to have a try and they're willing to take a risk. And I think that's what we need to do. I think we need to be bold and I think we need to take a risk. Because actually, if I look at this in another way, if I'm an Ofsted inspector and I'm coming to watch this, I'm going to be enraptured. I've got different types of learning. I've got multimodal systems. I've got really deep understanding. I've got no disruption. I've got active learning. It's all there and it's all very real. And I think that that would be as a direct consequence of the method of delivery. But obviously because it's a complex intervention, it's difficult because you need to think about the number of components, the number of interactions, the behaviours between people, the degree of flexibility and all those things. However, rather than getting hung up on the whole issue about how it works, is let's just show if it works first and then work out afterwards because I think we can pontificate over this and go nowhere, or we can just give it a go and say, well, we know it works, we'll work out why it works afterwards. And I think that's really important. And I don't think we're doing anything different using the method in a way. I think we've still got the coding and the uncoding. I still think we've got the, in the bits in there. So I think that that's, that's not new. But I think what is new is what you're going to see on the next slide. And I think that this is what's really important and what I've noticed. Okay, so are you all familiar with Tuckman's model of group dynamics? You put them together, they form a group. It's all a bit of a mishmash. Ideas get thrown around. Personalities take over. Then eventually you all kind of come to a civil agreement and then you start moving things forward. Is that the model that you're familiar with? So what I find using this method is that we we almost jump this bit and we get straight into the predictive bit. Now I can't articulate completely why that is the case, but it's what I see. And I almost think that the reason is because this bit is it's almost packaged because of how it's delivered. That there's trust, that there's all the other bits, people are not afraid, they haven't got to think about this, whether these are ideas silly or not, because actually we are celebrating the diversity of views, we're celebrating the different options. And we're doing it in a consequence free, safe, protected environment, because if I've got this on and I can't see, I'm probably going to be a lot more secure to speak because I'm not going to be worried about what people's reactions are because I'm not going to see the visual cues, I'm just going to be speaking. So if you're my teacher and you ask me a question, I can answer that question and not know anything else about what's going on around me, so it's just you and me. And if I'm a bit shy and I'm struggling a little bit, maybe that's the, the impetus for me to participate when I might not participate before because I'm anonymous in a way and I'm sort of, I can choose how much I step into the world. Whereas if I'm in a class and the and teacher's pointing the finger, how many people that you have, do you have in your lessons where you, you ask a question, you point, and the first thing they do is look, look down when you make contact with them. And I think that we get over that because we have this virtual world where people feel a bit safer. You know, and I do it on the bus. As an autistic person that travels on a bus, I find buses very, very stressful because they're full of people and they're full of uncertainties. So what do I do? I put my iPhone on 
I put my headphones on, I make it very loud, and then I flick through my phone, check my emails and do all those things and I'm absorbed in what I do. And then 25 minutes later, I'm at the stop where I get off. And I've kind of got over that. So I've kind of gone into that experience very purposefully to get over the other. So what barriers? Do we think there are barriers? Well, whenever there's change, there's good barriers, isn't there? Resistance to change is a massive one. Embracing new technologies. Fear of looking foolish in front of your peers when you try things that are new. I've kind of got over that now. I don't care anymore. I'll give it a go because I think it's more important to give it a go and maybe fall flat on your face than to be secure and not try something that's going to stretch our learners and going to be different. You need to think about the group dynamics as well. You need to think, how's, how am I going to make this work for my group? Do you, want, do you know what I mean? So in one of my groups, I've got a couple of learners who are, when they're focused, they're really good. And when they're not focused, they can be quite destructive to the rest of the group. So what I do is I focus on them and I give them lots of attention in terms of the learning. And then they get wrapped in it. And by the time they're wrapped in it, the lessons worked and they then they're really enjoying it and they don't feel it's a chore. And they're not clock watching, which is a really positive thing as well. So the barriers might be technical issues. They might be around equipment. They might be around transportability. As poor Alex showed today when he was bringing everything from the other end of college, it was logistically challenging moving things from one place to another. Um, disseminating new delivery to peers. Not everybody's going to get augmented reality initially. Not everyone's going to get the idea that you're doing something different. They're not going to understand the whole how it works or why it works. And part of that's because, because it's a complex intervention. You can't explain it in ways that can be simply discreetly broke down. But I think you can have fairly tangible evidence that it's worked. And as I say, the conceptual difficulties are just explaining explaining it because it can be appear a bit abstract. So the facilitating factors, my research fellowship um, enables me to spend time doing this, which is great. Uh, staff willing to engage and change practice. The fact that Jackie, is, as one of my peers, is here is a testament to that. TLC team and other people around the college as well. I'm really grateful that you've come. And the population of learners and learners that are familiar with the tech. We're almost in that transition between the millennials and the generation Zs. So we are going to have a population, so my son's one of them, that are so tech savvy from day one that you can give them something new and they will take to it like a duck to water. They will work it out so quickly and they'll come up with uses that are not even what we thought of. So what resources do we have? We've got fantastic equipment, such as the filming here. We've got the high-tech and digital building that's coming on. We've got good IT infrastructure. We've got special cameras, which I'll show you in a minute. We've got the use of mobile phone technology. We've got access to Wi-Fi. And we've got IT support. So, where do I think things have changed? I think that the way we are as people has changed. I think our needs have changed. Does anybody like the new Maslow? <laughs> I don't know whether I'm disgusted that I think it's right or whether I just need to just bitterly accept that that's probably where we are. But as somebody pointed out to me, if you have a battery and you have a phone, you can then find out where a shelter might be. So I do think there is a point to it. And I think that the whole of Maslow, if you look at it from that end, it's about education and understanding. Because as you move up the tiers and you get the higher needs met, they all come from you being aware and from you having an understanding and knowledge in education. And how do we get our knowledge in education? We don't get it from a textbook now. We get it from Wi-Fi and we get it from the internet and we get it from electronic resources. Libraries are beautiful. Don't get me wrong, I am a proper bibliophile. I absolutely love books. But I recognise that that 
ship has passed and that we are now moving into a technological age where data is important. So I don't think we should be asking our loans what the answer is. I should think we should be asking them why do they think the answer is what it is? Because we've come from a generation where the answers were not always available. Whereas now we do have answers for everything, but those answers are not always accurate or right. And it's about us having the ability to discern between what is fact and what is fiction. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we have are that a lot of the information and news that the children and around that we teach get are Facebook memes. And I know this because when I see some of the comments they make, you can see this where the source has come from because it's pretty much said verbatim. And actually when you say, well, actually, do you know that that's true? Well, I saw it on Facebook. Well, yeah, but where did it come from? Oh, I don't know. So they're quite naive in, in some ways, but they're quite critical in other. And I think that that's, I think it's about that critical eye. I think it's about that stretching them to be thinkers that question rather than blindly accept. And we can't teach them that. We can only give them the tools to give it a go. I think that's really important. So as of next week, I'm going to be recruiting staff that want to have a little go at trying this method. We're going to recruit somewhere in the region, hopefully of about 100 learners. And we're going to ask them about their experiences. We're going to do a before and after data analysis. The difficulty that we're going to have, I think, is going to be the data. Because we're going to be having lived experiences, we're going to have quantitative data, and we're going to have qualitative data. Now, me, in my research naive days many years ago, um, used to think that you could just put qualitative and quantitative data next to each other and it's fine. I now know that they're very different animals. Um, and I think that we need to have some input from a statistician in order to give us some advice on how best to handle the data. I think the qualitative one is probably going to supersede the quantitative because I think the lived experience is going to be the one that sells. I think we need to think about the problem of how we measure lived experiences about phenomenology. I think we need to think about qualitative statistics, quantitative statistics and kinesthetic learning. Hopefully get a paper, get a um, poster out pretty soon. And then a paper. So one of the things I want to show you is one of the things that I use in my lessons. Um, just to see what you guys think about this. So can you all see the board? Not the nicest thing I know, but it's, it's part of what we do when we learn. So can you all see it fine? Can you all see it fine? So, would you like to see the eye upside down, Sam? Yeah. I'm sure it's what you're here for, isn't it? Yeah. So what we can do is we can rotate the image. We can rotate it further round and go all the way back. Okay. What we can also do is we can you can have a grayscale. So if you've got learners that have got issues around color blindness or issues of other problems with their sites, we can have grayscale. We can have it on blue. Now, have you come across learners with dyslexia that use yellow filters? Guess what we've got? Beautiful yellow hue. And for some of my learners, they, that's so clear for them, it's remarkable. We can have black and yellow on black, and we can have this one. So what we can do as well, is we can do this. Can you see hello? On the screen, where I've written hello? Oh. Yeah, all I did was have the filter and got a pen, a dry wipe, and wrote, hello. And what I can do is I can invert it. 
so that it's up the right way. So in essence, what we can do is we can use this as a little board. So, well, okay, writing on the desk is probably not the ideal, but the idea is if we had a surface that we could use, that would be fine. What we can also do is this. We can take that camera and we can zoom. So here, So you can get a really clear idea. So if I'm doing dissection, that board is set up exactly the same as this board. So all the learner has to do is exactly what's there. Rather than having to crane over to look, we've got it directly in front of them. What we can also do is we can take one of these out. You might notice it's not quite the right way, but as you probably worked out, what we can do is we can rotate so that he's up the right way and maybe make it a bit bigger. So we could just focus in on those bones. But what we could then do is we could get an anatomy TV. We can get an iPad, we can take the iPad over to the image, and it would insert the organs underneath what you've got. So you've got a real 3D thing that you do purely by putting that over that. Or we could put the VR helmet on, and we could immerse the learner in that experience that way and because we've got so many different ways that we can deliver this you find a way that works for the learner has that been useful I will I will make one little slightly obvious point for this to work somebody has to put their hand in their pocket and pay for it because this is not going to be free but if we look at the potential long-term benefits of the learner of investing in this technology i think we reap huge gains from doing it Has that been thought through very carefully? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Useful? Mm -hmm. Because I genuinely think this is the way forward, particularly for health. Mm -hmm. I really think that this is, and I can see for sport as well, you can see this. And actually, if you looked at the hollow, hollow lens with the tree, mm -hmm. there was a performing arts component in there. There's loads, there's loads of applications. I think the, I think you are limited simply by your imagination, if I'm honest. But thank you very much for your time. So the plan, hopefully, is to roll this into PhD, which will be the next step. But I'm sure you were probably aware that's where that went. Yeah, it went easy, so yeah. It's positioned in the right place, I think, for that to work. I quite like the idea of it.